This show has been brought to you by Smith's Detection and the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. My voice is the voice that guides you home safely each and every day. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I am the voice of the safest and most efficient airspace in the world. I have to be 100%, 100% of the time. I am. I am. I am. I am a professional air traffic controller. Hi, I'm Scott Brockman, President and CEO of the Memphis Shelby County Airport Authority. And I'm here to talk to you about a very important issue to aviation. Whether you're a large hub, whether you're medium hub, small hub, non-hub, this is one of those uh, issues that will eventually impact everyone in aviation. It's the pilot shortage. It's real. It's coming down the pipe and we have to find a way to address this problem. We were very lucky this year. We did have uh, Senator Thune, his committee put forward an amendment to provide some latitude to the administrator of the FAA to address this. Doesn't look like that amendment is going to make its way through Congress. So we've got to uh, rally our cause and make our points in a different way. I have with me in studio today Bill Swellbar from Delta Associates. And Bill has been a great partner in looking and studying at this issue and has put together some great analysis. We're going to talk a little bit about that analysis today here in the studio. So, Bill, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Scott. So, we talked uh, all probably three, four months ago about uh, how we could move this discussion forward and, and you put together an analysis that drills a little bit deeper into the impacts of the pilot shortage. Why don't you talk a little bit about, about how you went about formulating that and what that study might tell us. Sure. Um, one of the frustrating parts about this whole process over, you and I have been talking about this since 2013. It's been a lot um, of years. It's been a lot of years. Um, and, and how do we target the folks on the Hill? And I think what was encouraging was that Senator Thune put forth an amendment. Mm -hmm. At least somebody is paying attention and recognizing the issue. But, it, but to go further, what we did is we analyzed all of the 322 non-hub airports in the, in the contiguous 48 states. And the reason for that is because they are the ones at risk first, right? There, we believe, I mean, certainly yeah. the trend has been the least common denominator comes out first. Right. And so we kind of, we rank those airports, all 322, based on eight different, the eight different economic and financial metrics. Yeah, sure. And so then we kind of divided it up into thirds. You know, bottom, bottom third, most vulnerable. Yeah. You know, the, the middle third, vulnerable. And, and the top third, probably safe. Um, well, the latest iteration, though, we actually took and, and put a little bit more relativity to the data by actually looking at what congressional district those airports fall in, right? Right, and that's exactly what we did with those 322 airports. Yeah. We, we, we labeled them by congressional district um, based on the, so you can see not only the congressional district that airport lies in, but is the airport considered quite vulnerable, kind of vulnerable, yeah. or less vulnerable? And so as, as I look at the, the issue um, across the, the spectrum of airports, it seems to be that there's a predictable trend that starts to occur. You have an airport that may have uh, four frequencies on a smaller aircraft that all of a sudden becomes three because one is upgaged then it becomes two and you start to lose the connectivity and the frequency. And while from a seat count, it may not look like it is uh, an impact on a community, it is really the start of what could be uh, the lack of connectivity to the global uh, community. You know, I, 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 absolutely. Um, for a small airport, 
we really need to look at things in less, not so much in terms of seats, but in terms of departures or right. frequencies. Because if I get below that three or four frequencies a day, yeah. and one of those flights happens to cancel, I'm a business person, am I gonna continue to use that airport? But now we have this pilot supply issue that is causing flights to get canceled. And so the reliability issue gets worse and worse. And it just, it just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a vicious, it a vicious cycle. Yeah. Um, and, and it really does impact um, the, the smaller airports already. We've lost nearly 20. Um, and most of those could be attributed to the pilot supply issue. So, um, as I said in my opening, it, it really is not just a problem for non-hubs and small hub airports because a, even a large uh, transfer hub, one of the mega hubs, if you will, without that connectivity to those smaller markets, without that access to those pastors who want to travel, they really don't have the viable hub they have. You don't need six or eight concourses you know, in Atlanta if the feed coming into Atlanta does not stay. So, I mean, so it's really not a problem for just the small airports. It's actually a challenge for all airports of all sizes, especially those that need connecting traffic, because without a spoke, you don't have a hub. That's, that's, that's right. And certainly you don't have the same number of banks of flights from the hub that you would have because it is those smaller communities that support that additional flight to Los Angeles and to San Francisco and to Seattle each and every day. So it, it, is, it is a perpetual issue and it feeds off each other. Atlanta, 22 million transfer passengers from small and non-hubs every year. 22 million, that's quite, you know, that's, could you imagine how, how the development of Atlanta going forward is if you take those out? No. Uh, you now have ends of concourses that are dark. Uh, so, you know, so let's, so let's talk about, about where we need to go from here. Um, so how do we, and I, and I think the way, the way we do that is by, first of all, getting this information out that we're presenting today, uh, encouraging our airport members and consultants, the entire aviation community, because it's not just airports that will be affected. As airports lose air service, they're not going to need the services that they've always needed. Uh, and so that trickles down through an entire industry and has a tremendous impact. So we need to do, uh, we need to have more of a, of a grassroots effort. We need to have more of a groundswell of discussion and, and try to get more than just the airports discussing this issue on the Hill. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think it kind of begins with the economic development agencies, mm -hmm. with the chambers of commerce, those kind of people. Look, this is an economic development issue. If, right. if, if my community loses, loses its air service, it doesn't, it's, it's much less relevant in attracting new business tomorrow. Yeah. In Memphis, you know, we're obviously blessed with uh, the FedEx uh, World Hub. And we look at air service in terms of, you know, connectivity is global currency you might not be trading directly with another country, but ultimately the, tra the transfer of uh, people and packages or people and goods ends up having a uh, indirect impact across the global community. So it is global currency. If you lose that connectivity, why would a company stay in your community and drive three hours to, to be able to go to their clients? They wouldn't want to do that, so it's real. And it's something we need to pay very close attention to Absolutely. going forward. You know, Scott, to me, the most important aviation announcement in 2018 was when Amazon cut the list of second headquarter cities from 238 to 20. And if, as part of their criterion for choosing that 20 was connectivity to the strategic markets yeah. in the U.S. and around the globe. And, and I, to me, that's the most important and should be the first piece that opens everybody's eyes, whether you're a large hub or a non-hub airport. This is economic development. This is economic impact in your mm -hmm. community. And it was highlighted by, by a, a company looking to build a second headquarters. And, you know, and that was, 
very telling, uh, as you as you indicated, as to what was important to a uh, a business that needs to connect to the world, right? Which Amazon does. So, um, okay, so. So wrapping up here, so we've got this, this study that um, it, it's, it's a lot of data, but it's focused in a way that uh, a airport director can take that, their state map and sit down with their uh, local leaders, their business leaders, even go to their governors in their state legislature and look at um, the impacts that could occur as Airports get affected by the pilot shortage. So what we really need is for, for people to um, access the data, which we've provided, thanks to you. We've got available on uh, AAA's website and other locations, and we'll mm -hmm. put that uh, up at the end of the, of the clip, and have them take that data and use it to, um, to bring this message home. You know, um, what, what else is there for, you know, that we really could do that would be better? I think the, what's nice about this deck, I think, is that there are just a few slides that kind of speak to the issue. The fact that we're going to be 3,000 pilots short by, by 2020. That we're going to have to, as a result of that, we probably have to park another 300 small regional aircraft. Right? So it's an immediate issue. So it, it talks about the fact that yes, large, medium, and small hubs continue to grow, non-hubs continue to shrink. It kind of, there, there, there's a story up front, and then there's a page for, your, for that particular mm -hmm. airport director's state um, as to how it is that the non-hubs are kind of measure out relative to one another, and um, what, what district of congressman they should be talking to. So over the course of nominally the next five to seven years, um, and I don't remember the exact dates in the analysis, but what was the, what were the totals that you were showing? It was in the thousands and thousands on, on uh, the, the uh, uh, mainline carriers, uh, less on the regionals, but the regionals don't have as many to start with, so as you erode that base, we really don't have the, the fill coming in to the system to replace them. And so they just, as we saw with, uh, uh, was it recently Great Lakes that yes. uh, stopped operation because they just couldn't get pilots anymore. Right. So what are the, what are the numbers really show bef before we wrap? What this? it is, I, I, my analysis shows, is that the regional industry as we know it today will be sixty percent smaller by twenty twenty six. Wow. Yeah. So we're, so we are looking at a serious problem. There's a lot of. Um, there's been a lot of ideas bannered about whether it's, um, you know, airline targeted training, whether it's um, potentially pilot, uh, additional uh, pilot training uh, grants, and uh, whatever the case may be, we've got to find a solution because this is not going to solve itself. And there are claims, well, it's a pay issue on the regional level. It's not. It's a cost issue with the, the new 1500 hour rule of what it takes to become a pilot and get to where you can earn enough money to support, um, you know, a pay off your loans and support a reasonable lifestyle. And so pay may be a small piece of it, but when you leave college with $200,000 in debt and you're starting out making a, a 40 to $50,000 a year salary, doesn't work real well, it's hard to amortize. It's hard to amortize yeah. that, absolutely. So, okay, um, any finishing thoughts? You know, I, I, you raised the pay issue. Yeah. And we've heard this from organized labor all the way through, yeah. is that all this is is a pay issue. Certainly pay was part of the issue. Um, what's interesting is they're the ones who negotiated those pay rates, but that's for a whole nother day. Yeah. Um, and, and as pay rates go up, at the regional level. Yes, it may attract pilots, but it also makes some small community air service uneconomic because the labor costs continue to go up, fuel costs are high, it's hard to amortize those costs across the smaller airplanes. So yes. it, 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 it may be a good thing in that it attracts some pilots, but it could also continue to bite some service 
um, because the system has structurally changed. And if your service is a uh, 34 seat Saab or a 50 seat uh, CRJ or whatever it happens to be, um, yeah, you start to lose the, the math, uh, doesn't work anymore as the costs go up. That's so. right. Okay. Well, as I said, we need you to energize on a local level. The best way for us to bring this discussion home is to have those who work, who are uh, benefited by the business of aviation, whether you're a consultant, whether you're a contractor, whether you're an airport director, uh, we need you to engage with your local communities. We need you to bring the economic issue to them so that they understand what the problem could be and how it could manifest itself. We need you to engage with your state governments, and we need to do that in a framework that says, look, we've got to raise this issue with Congress. We've got to move this ball forward because otherwise the industry that uh, we all know is not going to remain as robust as it is. And that means that our national economies, our state economies, our local economies will all be impacted uh, and we will lose a big driving force in what makes America great. So I ask you to give us your help, read the study, uh, pull the data. If you need more information, contact our team here at AAAE. They'll get you in touch with the information or you can get in touch with me or Bill so we can talk about the issue uh, because we need your help. I thank you for joining us today and we'll see you soon.